You're watching this special broadcast right here on NDTV 24-7. I'm Sonal Mehrotra Kapoor. Now, COVID-19 has shaken up the world in more ways than one. While COVID-19 has given rise to new challenges, new uncertainties, the pandemic has also yielded some valuable lessons. What we eat, our exercise habits, general washing, hygiene, awareness, they have all garnered greater focus than ever before. Health truly has now become a drawing room conversation. Also, COVID-19, because of the fact that people are home, they were homebound, there is a lot of stress as well. It has led to some lifestyle changes as well. It has disrupted what is what was earlier known as and what we understood as normal life. As a result, the metabolic problems have become more common. Unhealthy eating habits, lack of physical activity and even mental toll of the quarantine and the stresses, even the fear of uh, contracting the virus in the healthcare settings have all adversely impacted people and their lives. This also meant that for some reason we've seen higher number of diabetes patients and higher number of heart disease patients coming up post the pandemic. A multi-sectoral approach really promoting healthier diets, increasing physical activity can help in the slowing down of this diabetic endemic and the heart diseases that seems to have taken over the country. Today on the program, beating diabetes, facts versus myths, will how exactly does this impact a large number of people? We will try and decode for you some questions which are on everybody's mind but we often wonder how to really get about it we'll talk about what exactly is the problem in the disease area what to eat how to carry on with your life as well and we'll be taking all your questions regarding this with our panel today joining us on the broadcast is dr sheikh he's an mbbs he's a dnb in general medicine dnb in endocrinology as well and mnams in endocrinology consultant there at sefi and messina hospital Mumbai. Mumbai, thanks so much for your time, Doc. Also joining us is Dr. Chandan Das. He is an MBBS MD, uh, medical consultant physician at Vivekananda Hospital in Bhuvaneshwar. And also doc, uh, joining us is Dr. Sebastian. He is uh, MD, DM, FACC, F. SCAI, Senior Consultant at uh, Interventional Cardiologist at Asta MIMS in Kandor. Thank you all so much for your time. Let's kick start with the first question. Uh, and I just want to start with Dr. Sheikh over there. Dr. Sheikh, it has been seen, and like I said in my introduction as well, that many people who recovered from COVID-19 are slowly now seeing signs of diabetes and high uh, blood sugar glucose levels, high BP as well, uh, sort of creeping in now. Do you see that as a temporary impact or a more permanent one? And these could be individuals who are perfectly healthy, but again, seeing these signs, what is your advice to them? I think first part of the question, do we get this kind of diabetes? Yes, this is called as COVID diabetes or COVID induced diabetes and which is caused by SARS-CoV-2. Now the part two of the question, whether this is temporary or permanent. So SARS-CoV-1, when it came in the last decade, we have studies which say that that diabetes remained because of SARS-CoV-1 up to three years. But SARS-CoV-2 or COVID induced diabetes, we nearly need to wait till for some more time because we are still in, in the pandemic. Pandemic mm. is not yet ended. So mm. that is how we would wait. Diabetes, yes, it can cause permanent or temporary time will tell us. And number three, what do you do? So you would take same precautions as you would do even in an otherwise of a type two diabetes. So eat healthy, eat on time, sleep on time, regular mm. exercises. And that's how you would try to curtail down on your risk factors. Okay, so this is clearly a trend over there. But talking about people who already have pre-existing diabetes, let me take the next question to Dr. Das there. How does COVID-19 actually affect these people and are they at a greater risk, so to say then? Uh, see, we have a huge number of uh, research papers uh, from all the existing data from India and across the world. It's quite evident that diabetes, diabetic population have a worse course of COVID-19 disease than mm. normal population. Mm. And if somebody has a pre-existing diabetes, it's associated with an approximately four-fold increased risk of having severe COVID infection. By COVID infection, I mean COVID pneumonia. Mm. And there is also a significant higher proportion of ICU admissions increased requirement of steroid i know you know steroid can perpetuate the problem like 
if you mm. get steroid, uh, things will be worse. I mean, the blood sugar will be uncontrollable, it will be very extremely weird blood sugar. And we have longer hospital stay. I mean, days of hospitalization is more in diabetic than non-diabetic. And there is also increased oxygen demand. Mm. Even after uh, somebody is discharged from hospital, the patient requires uh, oxygen, domiciliary oxygen therapy at home. Mm. Uh, let me come to Dr. Sebastian then. People who have undergone, say, stent implants as well, and they have recovered now from COVID. What is what is your advice to them on how to take care of themselves in the post-recovery phase as well, especially when they've, you know, undergone a stent? Yeah, the people uh, who are underwent angioplasty and stenting, uh, definitely uh, the COVID assets. We know that uh, there's a high chance of blood clot formation in all over the body. So such patients should adhere to the treatment because most of these patients who underwent angioplasty must be on uh, drugs which will thin the blood, that is antiplatelets, which we call. Hmm. So they should continue to take those medicines uh, very uh, correctly because if you they stop and if they had a COVID, uh, then the chances of having the clots forming inside the stand is much higher. So my advice to them is if who are had angioplasty and stenting, had a COVID infection, they should continue their blood thinners. I see. So important to take note of that. That brings me to the next question to Dr. Sheikh there. Uh, there is a common belief, uh, Doc, that uh, uh, people believe that diabetes only impacts people who are obese. Is that true? And what are the risk factors involved here? First is that obesity or overweight is one of the risk factors now there are many other risk factors that a person can have with diabetes now these are modifiable which are three important one number one is weight itself that there is no single body type which is spared by diabetes so all body types especially when it comes to weight number two is the inactivity or the exercise that we do not do or the levels of physical activity that those are less and number three the type of the correct food or the nutrition that we take throughout mm -hmm. so these are three modifiable risk factors for diabetes and beyond these three there are many non-modifiable risk factors which you cannot change so for example one is uh, you're more than 40 years of age second is a primary uh, a first degree relative uh, in the family which who's got diabetes for example your mother father or your or your brother sister or mm. your daughter son number three is having another comorbidities also can be a risk factor which is can be non-modifiable like blood pressure cholesterol having borderline diabetes in the past or uh, women having polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, some women having a prior history of gestational diabetes hmm. or women giving birth to heavyweight babies, for example, more than four to four and a half kg. These are risk factors. So diabetes spares no boundaries and uh, no just one body type of weight. It, it, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum of risk factors. All right, that brings me to the next question and I have that for Dr. Das, if you could take that. You know, people using glucometers to check glucose levels at home, very good thing, of course, you need to keep a tap on that. However, most of them have hardly checked their HbA1c uh, levels. How important do you think it is to check that and at what uh, intervals should one be getting these tests? Done. Yeah, but so now you have two parts of the question. One is uh, 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 I won't need to explain about HbA1c. HbA1c reflects the cumulative glycemic history of the uh, of the preceding three months. I mean, it gives fairly an idea about what has been your blood sugar in the last three months, hmm. and it gives a sneak peek into how well your blood sugar have been doing over the past two to three months. So, and it's fairly accurate and it's on the spot test, which uh, correlates very well with the risk of long term diabetic complications. In fact, most of the existing guidelines, be it our own RSS DI, which is a diabetes guideline for India or American Diabetic Association or whatever uh, diet guidelines across the world, they actually give some uh, some uh, goals of HbA1c. I mean, the, the basically the treat, treatment monitoring happens according to the uh, uh, HbA1c level and the drugs, insulin or whatever therapy you give for diabetes, those therapies are titrated basing on this HbA1c levels. So HbA1c is a very important, I mean, you can uh, go for a glucometer test, I mean, the guidelines say that you have to, you should go for at least five glucometer tests in a day, which is not very feasible, very practical in, in normal population. Yeah. So HbA1c hmm. is a 
uh, is an entity which can give you a better idea about a fairly better idea about the uh, blood blood sugar level of the last three months. Let me take the next question to Dr. Sebastian. Then, Dr. Sebastian, uh, a lot of people have this. I don't know uh, what to call it really, uh, but you know, people, uh, there is trend going on, and a lot of articles talking about that if you cough very vigorously during a heart attack, you could actually save a life. Is that really true? And what should a caregiver really be doing with a person who gets heart attack? I also understand that heart attacks are more and more in younger people, especially, are getting very silent. So there was a time when movies talked about heart attacks where people would fall on the floor and they would feel a pulsation on their left arm and hold it. But now we hear of people getting strokes in their sleep. So are there any telltale signs that people can really pick up on? Yeah, so now, uh, first question is whether coughing will help uh, you know, preventing a heart attack. Hmm. It's not true because a patient who had a heart attack, suddenly they can go into cardiac arrest. So when you talk about cardiac arrest, uh, sometimes it happens when your heart rate comes down significantly down, or sometimes your heart rate goes up very high. So such situation, coughing might help because that can prevent the heart rate uh, going down. So when you cough, your heart rate increases. That can prevent the uh, uh, heart uh, rate going down. And so, uh, on the other side, if the heart rate goes very fast, also sometimes coughing can revert back into normal heart rhythm. So patients with heart attack who develop this kind of uh, abnormal heartbeat, those subset of patients get benefit from doing this maneuver. But otherwise, if a heart attack patient by coughing, as such, it's not going to make any change. And uh, second question uh, yours is, what the caregivers uh, should do about the mm. you know, heart attack? Right, so very silent uh, ones that are coming in these days. That's right. So mostly the the problem is like we have a classical description of heart attack that you know people should have uh, just pain, then they should have sweating. No, mostly uh, this kind of symptoms may not be there with the people, especially who are diabetic. You know, people with diabetic they may not have the classical symptoms of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So they may just feel a little bit of sweating. They will feel a little bit of a gas problem. Uh, they may feel a little bit of giddy. So the question is, uh, that, like the thing is, we have to have a high index of suspicion of a heart problem hmm. in uh, such people like diabetic patients. If they have mild uh, difference in symptoms or any abnormal feeling they have, they should go to a hospital, take an easy and see that they don't have any major cardiac problem. And on the other side, the prevention is the better thing, you know, that hmm. patients with diabetes, they should undergo regular heart checkup. What we suggest is at least once in two years, you should undergo stress test, blood milk test. That will try to find out whether they have any significant block. I see. So the interesting bit over here is that if you already have diabetes, be more careful about anything that your body is trying to tell you. Become a little more vigilant to whenever your body tells you or gives you a sign. Don't overlook it, especially in these times. And that is the key. That's a good note to take a break on. When we come back, we'll talk about the other aspect of it. Well, what about diet? What about health as well? We'll take note of that and how that plays a huge role in keeping you fit. And like we said, because in this post-pandemic you know, pandemic world, all of us are keeping such a keen eye on our bodies as well. We'll talk about that on the other side. Welcome back. You're watching this special broadcast where we are talking about diabetes, heart diseases in this post-pandemic world. What are the changes that you and I can adopt to ensure that you have a fitter life? Let me go to Dr. Sheikh on this next question now. Dr. Sheikh, now, due to the pandemic-induced lockdown and work from home, etc., there is a dramatic change in the lifestyle of people as well. People with diabetes uh, have been most impacted, of course, due to increase in the diet intake, less exercise, etc. Uh, can for Following a specific type of diabetic diet, is that something that you prescribe to your patients or anybody who has a vulnerable heart, say, or has high blood pressure? Should they be going on these diets to ensure that they have their system in check? 
So a diabetic diet that we try to understand is for our people, I think I would talk in this way that we as a nation are carbocentric. There have been a lot of studies that uh, we have a lot of uh, maybe breads, maybe a lot of wheat in, in our breakfast especially. And of mm. course, we have it throughout the day. So there can be some kind of moderation in the diet for carbohydrate. Although if some people can actually uh, tolerate, we can go for low carb diet for these people. Low does not mean zero. I think that's the message I would like to give uh, through uh, your channel today. Apart from this, I think we are kind of really deficient in proteins. That should be increased and increase the number of uh, fiber, the grams of fiber per thousand calories that we should be doing. Approximately 30 to 40 gram of fiber uh, should be there in 24 hours diet. Increase your our fruit uh, intake, increase the nut intake, especially almonds and walnut. Increase in at least variety of vegetables that we get, whether green mm. or different uh, colored uh, type of vegetables. Eat on time. And more importantly, it's not just one issue of diet. Also, we need to inculcate water drinking because chronic dehydration also can cause a lot of issues, including mm. the heart, since you spoke about it so well. And also, it's the sleep, a good quality of sleep, sleeping usually at night time, Unless you're a night shift worker, it's a different issue. But night mm. sleep is very, very important. And diabetes is an overall disease. It's like you take care of your diabetes and diabetes takes care of you. So 80% is more about lifestyle mm. modification, the food that we eat, the water that we would consume mm. in quantity, mm. the sleep and the amount of stress that we need to reduce. And it's 20% that's the tablet that helps us in diabetes. And if we go to Dr. Das on the next question, again, it's lifestyle related. Dr. Das, now though gyms and parks are open, people are still scared to actually get out. What exercises would you suggest, especially for diabetic patients that can be done at home easily? Uh, yes, exercise is part of the lifestyle the modifications we uh, talk about. And most of the time, these are just lip services by doctors and patients as well. Um, we, we need to see that the patient actually have the intent to do something like that because uh, uh, that's the it's most essential part of diabetes management apart from diet and drugs. And uh, if, if somebody is very scared to go out, he can basically do some kind of brisk walking inside the house and around the campus. What I mean by brisk walk is uh, around 100 steps per minute. Uh, you need not start from 100 steps uh, from day one. You can, uh, you can start slow and you can make it 100 steps per minute in later dates. And if you have, uh, if your budgets allow, you can go for a home gym, uh, maybe a treadmill or a static cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, some kind of resistance exercises like uh, like calisthenics. Calisthenics mean in, in, in common word what we call push-ups. Mm. Push-ups and squats, these are the best static uh, resistance exercise, exercises we advise to people. Mm. And our own indigenous yoga and pranayams are also good, good exercises mm. to go for and uh, diabetic, who are, especially who somebody who has other cardiac elements, he did not go for gymming and all, you can go for this yoga and pranayams, they are also uh, a good uh, exercises to do at home. Right, good to know that. Let me come to Dr. Sebastian on this last question really. Uh, Dr. Sebastian, we talked about heart diseases and we talked about diabetes. I just wanted to understand if gender plays a role at all when it comes to heart diseases. Do you think m men compared to women, is there one gender which is at a higher risk? The thing is, uh, usually we have a thinking that uh, females are usually protected from coronary artery disease and heart attack. But that is, uh, the trend is changing now. Because uh, because of the hormonal benefit, ladies are usually the heart attacks in heart ladies are in the later age group after their menopause. But now we are seeing a change in the trend that ladies are getting uh, uh, heart attacks at much earlier so the heart attack usually develops in male people uh, 10 years uh, younger when compared to this. And uh, if you look at the coronary anatomy, the anatomy of the heart, uh, there's mm. a definitely difference between the male and female gender, definitely, yes. I see. So what you're su suggesting is that the gap that seemed to be really, uh, you know, quite a bit earlier, that's close, it's closing up a little in these times. So everybody needs to be as alert and careful and perhaps take care of their health as much. Well, that's all the time we have on the program today. Thank you all very much uh, for answering all Thank these you. very valuable questions, something that is on everybody's Thank mind. Thanks so much for joining us.